All right, hello. My name is Jesus Mireles, and I'm here to talk to you about our API management journey. I'm a technical architect at USAA, where I'm responsible for the API infrastructure domain. Lately, my focus has been around maturing our API management platform, which we'll talk about in this presentation. Uh, USAA, you know, we're a financial services provider that is primarily focused on military members and their families. Today, we serve over 13 million members and have sold over 48 million products. We have over 36,000 employees, and if you're interested in joining our team, you can visit the link on this slide. My goal for today is to go over some background and history. We'll talk about some of the challenges we face and we'll go over our solution. So to kick things off, we need to talk a little bit about API governance because it was one of the key drivers for our solution. And API governance is really gonna have a different meaning from one organization to another. So I feel it's important just to level set and show you some of the attributes that make up our governance. Well, so first, uh, we wanted to have a way to share our APIs with consumers so that similar business capabilities do not have to get reinvented every time a new use case came up. Uh, we wanted to share our APIs, so it's also important to share that documentation and share how to use that API. Uh, next, we wanted to be able to track API usage by consumer. Uh, this, you know, These insights you gain from tracking usage at that level is going to be great. And you're going to be able to achieve things like chargeback models or IT teams can have some insights on how their APIs perform at an operational level, you know, per consumer. And you can start making decisions on your architecture or whatever. Uh, business partners can then use this data to prioritize work and make smarter business decisions. Um, knowing where your APIs are deployed and how they're secured at any given deployment is important to us. USA operates in a highly regulated industry. So if an auditor comes to us and asks, hey, where is your API deployed or how is this uh, secured or who's calling your API? We need to be able to answer these types of questions. Uh, another big part of our governance is uh, defining interface standards and best practices for developers to follow. Uh, when they create their APIs. So these things can be things like uh, what HTTP status code to use for certain interactions or naming conventions or other best practices that come that end up becoming standards, um, such as maybe keeping personally identifiable information for instance, off a URL, you know, uh, I asked, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about already uh, how business can, uh, business partners can use this data, this tracking data to capture metrics and analytics. Um, so metrics and analytics are a big part of governance. And so, um, you know, you may already know, and I've been doing this for a very long time. So believe me when I say that governance is going to be hard. Uh, no matter where you're at or how you do it, it's going to be very difficult. But I do believe that with self-service tools and automation, uh, we can make governance maybe a reality. And I don't think you can ever get to a perfect model, but I do certainly think that you could make it better and easier for your developers by giving them the right tools that can help with governance. So this is a high level timeline. Uh, of some of our major events that helped shape our solution. And it really all started in 2007 when uh, the SOA governance board was established. This was a group of senior engineers that would meet once or twice a week and they would uh, go over any soap service that was getting created at that time. And that group was basically, you know, they would review your contracts, they would name, uh, figure out your naming conventions, are you using the right ones? Uh, what security models and, uh, you know, and review if there was already another capability that existed, which could be reused instead. So in 2008, we started to share our APIs a little bit more with external consumers and mainly on our B2B channels. So uh, we purchased licensing for an XML gateway that was already, you know, I guess I would say it was very anemic. Um, it was just really a reverse proxy with not a whole lot of capabilities. But uh, in 2011, we had to upgrade those proxies because we started uh, really doing a lot more advanced ta uh, tasks with our B2B consumers or you know, our business processes were being exposed to more, more of those external consumers. So we started using um, our SOAP services even a lot more within our enterprise. So we, we ended up needing to upgrade those gateways again, um, well, in 2011. 
So all that was great in the land of soap and services back in 2014, though things started to change a little bit. Uh, I had uh, just taken over the API infrastructure domain, and I was starting to push a lot more for more RESTful services at that, uh, you know, at that time. And in that same year, we started putting some of these services on the gateways, actually. So we had to adapt a new security model for these services. And things were okay, but it was still very painful to release any of these services into production. And one of the reasons was that you still had to go through uh, that same governance model that was established back in 2007. So that meant that you had to get on the calendar to meet with the governance board to have your API reviewed. And uh, the other problem was that in order to push any policy to our gateways, you had to submit a request and have an ops engineer you know, create a policy for you and then promote that policy to production, you know, all based on your release date. So a very painful process. And in 2015, we knew this was obviously not going to work, you know, because USA started seeing more single page applications all of a sudden for our website. And then our mobile app was also gaining a lot of popularity. So we started seeing an explosion of these types of uh, HTTP APIs on these gateways, you know. So <laughs> so the first thing we, were, we tried to do was, we, we try to scale our governance, you know, by introducing a template on our wikis that developers can go and document their APIs so that the governance group had some idea of what you were bringing to the meetings before you actually got to the meeting. And hopefully we can capture some of the uh, easier ones, you know, and just knock them out and give them their approval before they even came to the meeting. Uh, we also ramped up the meetings from once a week to daily just to try to keep up with that demand. Uh, we knew that we had gaps with sharing our contracts and these wikis could get out of date really quick. And so when the code changed, the wiki sometimes wasn't updated. So now what you were bringing to governance was maybe not accurate anymore. So, you know, we we were also having a hard time keeping track of what APIs the governance group had already approved and so on and so forth. So it just got really messy. So a year later, we created uh, a portal to kind of help us store Swagger files. Then, uh, so now developers were being asked to generate these files and catalog them. And the goal here was to keep these files accurate with the code and being able to share with more engineers across the organization was a, a big plus to having a, a kind of a centralized catalog. And these also gave engineers a way to upload their documentation so that governance board now had a, a little something more accurate you know, to review. And uh, the governance group also had now a front door to keep track of these uh, documents that they were reviewing. So at this point, the governance board approvals were done in virtual meetings sometimes, and things were going a little bit more smooth, um, you know, because all the assets were, were in the portal now. And so in 2018, though, yeah, we saw another explosion of APIs because USA started using uh, container orchestration platforms, which meant that engineers were deploying more HTTP-based APIs and had different scaling needs now. So our gateways were running on old school software appliances and really scaling was not going to be easy due to hardware needs. And we may have already had constraints due to how much we were licensed for anyway. So scaling was not really going to be feasible for us. So we set off to look for a new vendor solution. Uh, but ultimately, we decided to replace our gateways with a new proxy, which we'll be releasing sometime in 2022. So um, some of the challenges that we had, you know, so we saw a quick timeline just now, of, uh, and I mentioned some of these challenges already, but I wanted to highlight these. The first major challenge was the scaling and the maturing of our governance. We wanted to mature the process of client management and client observability, uh, but up until now, we only had a catalog and no actual client management. So if there was any client management, it was all done manually and configured manually. Um, so developer empowerment, there was virtually none. Uh, you know, you had to still go to an ops team to deploy your services. So we knew that uh, we needed more automation around that and self-service tools where our portal could push policy to these gateways. So the maintainability of these gateways was a huge factor as well. 
we were still dealing with databases and and deployment models that were just not really friendly for scaling. We had to take advantage of some of the newer technology. Well, we wanted to take uh, advantage of the newer technology, like maybe looking into running these gateways in container in containers as well, you know, and and being able to scale those that way instead of scaling hardware. Um, so obviously we were, you know, there was lots of challenges there, but those three were probably the the drivers that finally tipped the scales for us. So uh, we knew that something had to change. So we wrote down our requirements. And I would say that these are probably the most important functional requirements that, that we, we have in our list. Um, so we'll go over some of these. So first, uh, we wanted uh, API discovery, which to us really meant having a searchable catalog to find APIs and their associated information. So things like, where is this API deployed? What security model does it use? Uh, you know, those things that governance cares about. So having this catalog could also serve as an inventory of all our APIs in the enterprise. So one goal was to catalog all the APIs. And we do that virtually now by having a script that scans our source code repositories for, you know, projects that expose out HTTP-based APIs. And we ask those teams in a friendly email, uh, you know, to catalog their APIs if it's not already cataloged. And so uh, the next thing was that we had to, have a product that integrated with all the current, with our current analytics and traffic monitoring platform. Uh, we didn't want to have engineers have to correlate data from the API management platform uh, and with uh, with our existing platform. So, you know, correlating that data and triaging all that, like we didn't want, we didn't want multiple tools for the job. So we were not interested in buying a platform, uh, you know, that came with us with its own uh, analytics and, and logging platform because we, we wanted to use our existing existing one. Operational integrity, of course, you know, big deal. We wanted it to be scalable under load. We wanted it to be performant. So we were looking for something that can keep up with our demand. Um, API orchestration, you know, to us, uh, that meant having a rich set of policies that we can apply to our APIs. So things like rate limiting, uh, data loss prevention, timeouts, and security are some that come to mind. We also had to basically, uh, we wanted a give developers a little bit better tools. So things like Canary, which we haven't been able to really do in our legacy environment, or, you know, things around slow rolling capabilities. So those kinds of things were very difficult to achieve in the old system. Um, and, you know, for the most part in our old platform, most of the policies were very simple. They had a single upstream maybe uh, because others, otherwise, if, if you had multiple upstreams, for instance, you had to have this, uh, ops engineer in, you know, creating these complex policies manually, you know, and so when teams st started breaking up their monolithic applications, the need to send requests to multiple upstreams was becoming more desirable. And so we, we really wanted to address that and make sure that any product that we chose would be able to uh, have these, uh, this orchestration feasibly or feasible. So uh, next, we wanted to also, we already had a security model that I mentioned before. So that was not something that we could replace. Most products on the market offer a security solution, and a lot now actually do allow you to integrate with external vendor products or vendor solutions for security. But sometimes these are either out of the box integrations and sometimes they're not. So, you know, it's kind of hit or miss there. Uh, for us, we had this as a hard requirement. So we, at the time, uh, there was nothing that was out of the box that could integrate with our current uh, security platform. Um, so we, we had to basically do it ourselves. So that meant that if you had an OAuth client, for instance, that you were creating uh, or anything like that, you would have to create that OAuth client in, in the security platform somehow. So something had to integrate that together. And so our um, API lifecycle was something that we looked at as well, because we felt that retiring, retiring APIs, which really doesn't happen all that often, um, but versioning APIs was also not happening enough. And because there was a lot of challenges there, you know, you, we didn't have proper client management. So how can you notify your clients when a version changed, right? So we wanted a way that, uh, that when you version your API, that you can notify your consumers what they needed to do, whether that was, you know, did you introduce a breaking change or do you want them to move to a new version? Um, so these were some of the types of capabilities that, that we were looking for. 
And then lastly, we wanted to have an easy experience for engineers. Our goal was not to require you to have special training or to have to go to, you know, pages and pages of documentation to use our platform. We want our goal that we set off for was let's make this as easy and comprehensible as possible. So as I mentioned before, you know, that our first solution was to build something temporary while we found a vendor solution that worked for us. This became very challenging, though, because most of the API management products on the market seem to work very well for sharing APIs outside the organization um, to like third party developers or B2B consumers. But, you know, most most of these didn't work well for internal API management. Um, some of the biggest challenges that we had with that uh, maybe were around governance. Um, you know, the governance board capabilities were not available, which comes to no surprise. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier, API governance is going to have a different meaning to everyone. So, you know, it's going to be impossible for these vendors to meet everyone's different requirements, if you will. You know, so that, that, that was not very surprising. But we still had these requirements. So, um, we had other types of requirements as well, though. Things like you cannot release a gateway policy into production unless there is a valid release management approved change request. You know, so uh, if we wanted to have an experience for uh, for our service governance board to approve APIs, we had to build our own portal. Uh, that was another thing, right? So I talked earlier about how uh, governance board members go and approve an API. Well, we would have to build that in. Um, and most vendors, really, that's what they told us. They said, hey, you know, if you have a very unique experience, um, so therefore you're going to have to kind of create your own API or your, your own UI, but here's some APIs that you can use. So if you recall, I already mentioned that we had to use our own metrics and analytics platform and our existing security platform. So now I'm having to integrate all these different uh, platforms and then build my own UI on top of that. So now it's like, okay, well, what exactly am I paying for again? Uh, you know, I, come, I came to the conclusion basically that we'd be paying for a very expensive proxy uh, because uh, all that we were really leveraging you know, was um, the proxy itself. Because on, you know, on top of that, I had to have this huge engineering team to create this custom UI and then integrate all these different uh, platforms, my analytics platform, my security platform, my CMS perhaps, you know, for pipeline and then uh, my release management system. So, you know, we go back to the drawing board and we're like, okay, let's look at what, what it, would it take uh, you know, to just replace our gateway then with a different product. And here's what we looked at, you know, many options in the market. And ultimately we decided to go with glue. Uh, this was the most cost effective for us because we already had most of these pieces uh, already kind of done. Uh, but we were kind of missing some of the capabilities that glue has to offer. So uh, unfortunately I'm unable to show you a demo of our portal, even though I would have loved to, as uh, you know, I'm actually very proud of all the work that our team has done with it. Uh, but I can talk to you about some of our, uh, the major capabilities that uh, our portal has. So first of all, our assets are owned by teams. So we didn't want to, or we didn't want to have individuals owning assets because many of us change teams or companies, and we didn't want to have a complex transitioning process between these assets. So teams are built off AD groups and we manage them that way. So we have a robust catalog that has a snappy search engine behind it. Uh, we're able to catalog Swagger files and WSDL files. Um, our search engine can search these artifacts. And then uh, we also have the capability to tag things. So you're also able to search for tags. Um, engineers have self-service tools to help them deploy their APIs. Uh, we have a pretty nice wizard that, that asks you, you know, to choose what zone you're going to, what environment you're going to, uh, do you want, you know, where do you want to deploy this to? And then it has a step-by-step -step, um, UI wizard, I would call it, that uh, helps you create your upstreams and then your policy creation. So some of these policies are automatically added for you based on the zone and the environment that you choose. Uh, and then there are some that are configurable. So all this is integrated with our release management system. So it pushes to prod verify, you know, before you actually push it to prod, that there is a valid uh, change request that is scheduled on that date and time and all that. So uh, API consumers have an experience to request access to an API. 
You know, so things like, uh, you know, you have to provide your business case. So I go and search and I, I go into the catalog. I search for an API. I find uh, one that I like, and then I have to, I request access and I provide a business case. So if the owner decided to allow anyone to consume it though, then I'm auto approved. But if not, then someone from that team that owns that API approves my request. And then my API key gets approved to consume that API. And the portal kind of orchestrates sending that API key to the proper, um, you know, glue instance that's gonna that's gonna enforce that API key. So, uh, API owners can also manage their clients. So, if there's like a bad actor or or something, you know, any any reason that they want to revoke access, uh, they can do that from the portal. Uh, then, lastly, we we have an analytics and reports embedded in our tool. Um, to view the usage, error rates, and, and whatnot. So, and then whatever other, you know, kinds of reports that we have to offer. Um, so we also have APIs uh, that, um, you know, things like pipelines can leverage for integrations or whatever internal employee tools we may have that, um, that require our APIs. Okay, so most organizations are going to have a similar model to ours. And that's that you'll have an edge proxy sitting somewhere uh, at your network, right? And then all that traffic, you know, uh, has this model and that at, at the most simplest model that you have is an HTTP call from mobile applications or your website that will hit an upstream API sitting somewhere, maybe on your on-prem, you know, in this case uh, for us, we do have uh, services that are deployed to some application servers or mainframes. And, and so these APIs can be, you know, sitting in our data center and, and our edge proxy will, will forward request onto that. So, but uh, you could even have a, you know, container orchestration platform, something like Kubernetes or OpenShift. Most of these platforms, you know, they already have a proxy. At least in our case, uh, we chose to replace our default proxy with Glue. Um, so now our edge proxy is glue edge and then our ingress proxy to our container orchestration platforms is also glue. Uh, we did this because we wanted to be able to manage clients that call into these platforms. So, you know, we have multiple platforms and legacy servers. And so we felt that uh, we needed to be able to track the usage of clients, you know, between these platforms. So we wanted a more sophisticated proxy to ingress into these container orchestration platforms to enforce things like API key and, and use these keys to basically create the proper, um, I guess, logs and analytics that, that we would need. So then, uh, you know, you also might have, uh, at least in our case, we do also have cloud, public cloud um, APIs running, you know, and you might have edge route to these as well, and, you know, into a work, into a cloud workload, such as maybe Lambda or EKS or Kubernetes or whatever you have running in cloud. So the nice thing for us is that developers uh, use a single tool. And in this case, our API portal uh, can handle uh, lots of these, all these configurations. So uh, we, our portal will fully manage the edge proxies and, you know, it still uh, interfaces with Glue's control plane, but um, as far as developers interface with, they only interface with our, with our uh, portal API or our portal UI. So uh, in the case of ingress proxies, it will also push API keys that have been approved um, for that cluster, right? So, but any other complex policy, uh, that's in the ingress proxy will live with the code itself. So the application, you know, the, the engineers will have glue configurations in their projects that manage that glue ingress proxy. Uh, and then while the API portal mainly manages the API keys for that, for that cluster. And so all this, you know, it's all available via self-service tools and some of the automation that have made our platform a little bit better through pipelines or whatnot. And so this is a very high level uh, but I hope you get the idea of what we were trying to improve or how we improved our, you know, our API management practices. And so with that, I hope that you get an idea of what our journey looked like and a glimpse into our solution, you know, and I want to thank Solo for having me today. Okay. Thank you.